So welcome to this conference, conference today on the emerging Trump administration trade policy. Um, my name is uh, Michael Moore, and I assume you're here to hear about my new documentary about the Trump administration. Um, uh, it's, I tell you, it's, it's a little dismaying to, to have this name in Washington, D.C., because uh, you either get the best uh, table in the restaurant or they put you next to the dumpster fire out, uh, out back. Uh, but my, my mother says that I'm uh, smarter and better looking than the other Michael Moore. But, you know, you, you would expect that from your mother. I mean, you know, there, are, there are some certainties in life. Um, but in my real day, real day job, I'm a professor, professor here at George Washington University working on trade policy for the last 30 years. And I can honestly say there's never been a more interesting time to do this uh, for, uh, for better or for worse. Um, the Elliott School's Institute for International Economic Policy is hosting this event, and we do a lot of interesting things on economic development, international macro policy, U.S.-China relations, and uh, recently some work on uh, global governance in the 21st, global economic governance in the 21st century. And uh, so when we started thinking about this conference, uh, Back in the fall, we thought, well, it could. I think it would have been sort of a pedestrian conference about how, if TPP doesn't get approved, what might happen. Some some interesting issues about digital trade that my colleague Susan Aronson does, and then uh, and then that all kind of changed on election day. You know, suddenly we think, okay, maybe we need to think a little bit differently about what uh, might be occurring. So we've we've got. Uh, together a group of trade experts, both lawyers and economists, uh, to talk about what the election means for US, the US, or for the multilateral trade system and this, this system that the US put together. Now, the focus today is really more on the US side of things. We very much are interested in what the trade administration can do, or may not be able to do, unilaterally without congressional uh, authorization, new legislation. I mean, it's really the existing system and how that can be uh, altered. So we, each panel has a lawyer and an economist. Uh, we, uh, many of these people have had extensive experience in, as practitioners in the, in, uh, in the government. My colleague Jay Shambaugh just stepped down at, at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, a couple of other of us have, have worked on at the, at the council as senior economists. We've got litigators. We've got people that are very much aware of the way the system has worked in the in the past. And I'd encourage you to look at their uh, their bios to see uh, to talk, uh, to learn about their their interesting uh, backgrounds. Now, the uh, about the title, Trumping Trade Orthodoxy. You know that that was chosen by me very much with a. Um, uh, with a focus on the trade orthodoxy part. Because, you know, really, I think it's, a, it's fair to say that among the trade policy community, there's broad consensus about, about how, the, the, how the system should work, even if the public doesn't share that. But I think for, for us, there's a, there's a broad consensus. And this is reflected in our panels. We've got Republicans, Democrats, independents. Uh, we've got U.S. citizens. We've got uh, foreigners. I, I'm from Texas, for example, so uh, you know, we wanted to get at least one t different uh, view of the world because we always think about things differently. Uh, now, I think there's every reason to think that uh, President Trump is going to have a, uh, a, a different approach to trade than every president since uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Skepticism about existing trade approaches has been one of the very few consistent aspects of his public statements over at least 20 years. I mean, he does a lot, he has a different views on a lot of different things, but a consistent tr uh, uh, um, critic of the existing trade system. And I think it's fair to say that Steve Bannon, a trusted advisor, has a, a pretty, uh, is a, well, let me just say, extremely contemptuous of the, of the system as it is now. I mean, that's just, that's just the reality. And so when I say trade orthodoxy, you know, really just put these, these items up here. It's one, it's this idea that trade is mutually beneficial, trade and investment for nations, as nations as a whole. It's rules-based with a focus on non-discrimination, but rules-based. You know, we set down the, the, the rules and we, 
as much as possible, adhere to those rules. So that really means most favored nation status and national treatment. And a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about today is about how potential unilateral moves fit into that system or not. But the deviations are, are usually administered or changed or, or uh, administered through these principles. Now, this, this next uh, idea is the adjustment cost. Now, adjustment costs are what economists mean when they, when they talk about people's lives ground up by changes in the economy, okay? You know, we, I think it's fair to say that economists recognize adjustment costs and the real pain that that can cause to people. And we ignore that at our peril. You know, the, you know, the cries of the afflicted, if ignored, can, well, a demagogue can be a hero if you ignore them. And there's real pain. Now, whether that's trade-related, whether it's automation, whatever, is another question. But the, but the cries are real. The legal structure that has been set up over the last 70 or so years, I think, at least from my view, has one basic assumption that's important to keep in mind. I think the assumption's been is that Congress is going to be the source of the problem. They delegate authority to the president because the president is seen as being less protectionist. I don't know. That may or may not be the case now. So we're going to talk a lot about these things today. Uh, certainly we have a president who is, who at least talks about trade as a, a zero sum. If we gain, uh, they lose. If they lose, we gain. Well, you know, one way or another, it's um, one person's gain is another person's loss. There's probably going to be a lot of self-initiated trade remedy cases. We'll talk about that in the first session. We've got broad, there's a possibility for broad, unfair trade practices determinations. We'll talk about the implications of that. We have the possibility of a president being unilaterally able to exit from existing trade agreements, not a potential agreement like TPP, but one like NAFTA. We'll talk about that. And the possibility of renegotiating. Um, and a focus on bilateral agreements rather than multilateral agreements. Now, that's a very different uh, world. That's not, okay, adding NAFTA into the GATT system. It's bilaterals, a series of bilaterals. That's a very different way to think about the world. And then we'll finally talk about, um, oh, I forgot to mention about the, the currency issues, but we'll uh, talk about that with, uh, in, the, in the context of China, but also the possibility of foreign investment restrictions through the national security determination. Now, that's, that's the, the CFIUS process, which some people have heard of, but a lot of people don't know about. We're going to learn a lot about the details of trade policy that haven't been exercised in a long time. So that's the plan for today. Now, we have, uh, we have uh, an audience here. We also have an audience uh, with, with this, uh, live streaming of this event. So we'll have, um, this is the first time I've been involved with live tweeted questions. So um, I think, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm sure, apparently it's done among those young people. So uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing people's questions in the audience and from outside. You know, we've got a distinguished audience here. Many people could be up here instead of us talking about these same issues. And so very much look forward to the questions.